Wasserman was an agent for MCA, which was Music Corporation of America, who became my father's agent, and then Lou Wasserman took care of him. And of course, eventually, they were, became the closest of friends. And Mr. Wasserman wanted to make television shows, so he started a company, an offshoot of MCA, called Review Productions. The first shows we did were out at Republic Studios, and we stayed there until they bought Universal when we moved to Universal in 1959. Lou Wasserman, who was the most brilliant of agents, and also he saw much farther than other people where you could take this business. And with Hitch, for whom he had a great affection and was a good friend of Hitch's, he saw the possibility of making him a world figure. He thought that it would be great to have a, a television show, and he didn't think my father was going to agree to it at all. And my father loved it. Joan Harrison was in charge of the entire Alfred Hitchcock Presents. She came with my mother and father in England. She was a scriptwriter, and I can remember them working, the three of them, uh, Joan, my mother, and my father. And then when he decided to come over to this country, he asked Joan if she would come with him, and she agreed. In fact, she and I shared a stateroom on the Queen Mary. She did not like boats at all and was seasick the whole time. <laughs> but she was a wonderful person and really brilliant. And then eventually, Norman Lloyd joined them. Well, I first met Hitchcock through this picture, Saboteur, and then he asked me to be in Spellbound, and I got to know Hitch better. And always, in my meetings with him, we would talk about pictures, and particularly story, and so on. So that at the beginning, he had a sense that maybe uh, there was something there of this actor who could be switched over behind the camera. He starts to do the television show in 1955. The half-hour show of Hitchcock Presents, then television was getting into the hour format. Uh, they were trying to expand, and so Alfred Hitchcock Presents went to an hour show. Then from there, uh, Mr. Hitchcock got involved in a series called Suspicion, and the Ford Theater would come on with specials, and he did uh, one of those. So they needed help in organizing material, finding material, casting, and all that kind of thing. And by that time, I had established myself to some degree as a director in the theater. So they invited me on. And I was <laughs> invited on as Jones' associate producer for six months. But I guess I must have passed the test, because I stayed for eight years. We would find the stories and submit them to Hitch for approval. And we would not go into screenplay, so to speak, without first getting his approval for every single story. Having done that, Joan and myself would hire the writer and get a screenplay. These would be sent up to Hitch and it was assumed he read them, and if there was any problem, you'd hear back. Very rarely. Usually, when he had an idea that would enhance the project, that would give you a twist that was even better than what you had. But the running of the show was left to us. I think it's fair to say <laughs> that Joan Harrison selected which shows Hitch would do. We would go over the stories and uh, she'd say, this one, Hitch should do this, and she'd send it up to him. He liked the same crews around him at all times. He had a crew that did all his features with him, each one. And then uh, when he started in television, of course, he didn't have a crew, and it was kind of awkward for him at the beginning, I believe. Then when, once he got to know certain individuals, they stayed with him on every show that he directed. 
Robert Stevens actually directed more episodes than any of the directors. We still had to make it look like a Hitchcock show, but Stevens brought in a certain kind of nervousness to it, which was awfully good. There were several other directors who were very good writers. There was Bradbury, there was Raoul Dahl, Robert Block. There were solid writers like William Fay, not a name, but always delivered a solid script that we could shoot. It's long distance for you, your office in New York. Thank you. Hello? The quality of actors that Joan Harrison used to get on the series were, in those days, they wanted to work with Alfred Hitchcock. You're making me sweat. Now, why don't you stop fencing around and get on with the story? All right. I have nothing to hide. Although he didn't direct all of them, they wanted to work on his program and be associated with him. And she had a wonderful quality of finding talent. Well, how do you do? Pat Hitchcock, uh, Mr. Hitchcock's daughter, who was an actress on her own and did roles in, in many of his features uh, through the years, did some television also, and she was marvelous. She was a good actress. May I have my key, please, number 342? Qui désirez-vous voir, mademoiselle? I'm afraid you've forgotten. I don't speak French. He did direct quite a few of, of the shows. And uh, I was really sorry I couldn't be in any of his. <laughs> I did a lot of them. I did two where I had uh, the leading parts. But then I would play, you know, just small parts, you know, and just whenever they needed a maid or something, I'd go in and do it. Oh, uh, incidentally, uh, I thought the little leading lady was rather good, didn't you? The lead-ins and the lead-outs that Hitch did with every show. It must be mentioned that these were written by a man who I think had a spark of genius, James Allardyce. And he wrote every single one of those lead-ins. But it must be said that while Hitch's lead-ins would not have been as brilliant as they were without Allardyce, vice versa was also the case. Because without Hitch, Allardyce would not have had this, if you'll excuse me, this vessel in which to promulgate these mad ideas that he did for a period of 10 years. This is an axe. I say this for the information of those of you whose television tubes may have burned out. I wish to reach the widest possible audience. Mr. Hitchcock would always do the lead in and lead outs for every show and what we would do was be every oh golly, six weeks maybe, or five weeks, he would come in and do, oh, 10 lead-ins or 10 lead a day's work, in other words. He gave me this ticket for blocking an aisle during the rush hour. And we had a lot of fun with him because uh, they poked fun at him in many, in many instances. Even on stage when he was doing it, he played it very straight. Excuse me, I need a moment to pull myself together. Later, Allardyce, who wrote the lead-ins, did the trailers for Psycho. You see, even in daylight, this place still looks a bit sinister. Which I photographed with him, um, walked through the sets and said, this is where Mother slept and this is where Norman uh, stayed, etc. And then and, and down to the motel and, and this is the spot, you know, something happened here. Uh, it, was, it was very clever. Oh, I think uh, drawing the silhouette, um, he started that in England a long, long time, very, very early on. His profile became very famous, just the profile that he had drawn. Now, the idea in the main title of his profile being up there, and then he walking in and fitting his own person into the profile in time to the music. The music uh, which became so identified with Hitchcock was the funeral march of the marionettes by Gounod. As researchers proved, Hitch first heard this 
apparently in 1927, long before his television show. That was the music he thought would be great for the, the show, and it was. It was forever identified with Alfred Hitchcock Presents after that. About Hitch directing on the show, and he, of course he did the most famous one of all, which was called uh, Lamb for the Slaughter, a Ralph Dahl story where Barbara Bel Geddes kills her husband uh, with a frozen leg of lamb and then roasts it and serves it to the police who are looking for the evidence which they're eating. Well, we had to shoot it the second time because the crew laughed. It was, it was just broke them up because they didn't know that was coming. It was great. Supposed to be all right to take this bone home to my dog? Sure, she said she never wants to see it again. Broadcast standards in those days, no one could get away with murder. That's what it came down to. As for Mary Maloney, she would have gone scot-free if she hadn't tried to do in her second husband the same way. They didn't know whom they were dealing with. They were dealing with <laughs> Jimmy Allardyce, who had the person of Hitchcock <laughs> as his vessel. <laughs> and so, retribution. She married again and decided to do away with the second husband in a similar fashion. Unfortunately, he was a forgetful type and had forgotten to plug in the freezer. The meat was as soft as jelly. Now, if you accept that as retribution, <laughs> that's retribution. <laughs> but you see, Hitch never gave up. <laughs> he would always, in some way, get his point in, which let the audience know we're only kidding. <laughs> it was beautiful. At every point, Joan and myself had to think, would Hitch like this? Would Hitch approve of this? Are we reflecting the Hitchcock persona? Oh, I'm uh, glad to see so many of you are still with us. There was a disturbing suggestion at the very close of our story, which I wish to clear up at once. This show was all Hitchcock. It wasn't about Joan or about me. It was about the star. He was our star. But when we had a rough cut, we had to call him, and we brought the picture up to him, and he would look at it. And his reactions were fascinating. If he liked it very much, he'd say, good. <laughs> if he didn't like it very much, he'd say, thank you. <laughs> and sort of leave the projection room. The television show Oh, golly, stayed on for 10 years, and there were 359 episodes that were shot. Um, it's unbelievable that it was so popular. It just, everybody wanted to see Hitchcock. They wanted to see what he looked like, how he acted. By the way, have you noticed that thin air seems to be the type of air most conducive to disappearances? Hitch became one of the biggest television stars of his time. All over the world, or that is to say, wherever the series played. He couldn't go anywhere without being recognized. But he was so good with people. He was just wonderful. He uh, always gave them time. He was very aware of fans, and he was, he was wonderful to them. He really was. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh. Good evening. In the mid-50s, when Alfred Hitchcock Presents came on television, they were the forerunner of a type of television that was new. I think from that came uh, the thriller and came Twilight Zone and came that type of show. It was a very successful show because people loved the humor. You see, everybody loves humor. They really do. We shall save the rest until next week, when I shall reappear. Until then, good night.